we might get started now that uh, we've given everyone a moment to jump on board and uh, I might just introduce uh, uh, everyone here today. So my name is Michael Buckland. I am the CEO of the McKell Institute. Um, we are here with Peter Van Onselen, who has many different titles, um, uh, author, journalist, uh, and he's with the University of Western Australia uh, in public policy and politics. Um, but we're joined today because we have a, uh, because of this book, um, the you, who you dare this one, Michael? I don't, I don't want to overplug it, but yeah, you know, yeah. <laughs> well, I've, I've got to get it right. I've clearly not practiced. Um, but who dares loses uh, uh, pariah policies, which is um, I think sums up the mood of um, of much of the political debate over the last probably since the last election, where it was widely seen as maybe um, you know policies aren't aren't necessarily a great political. <laughs> Um, decision anymore, which is a big problem for those of us who believe that um, Australia needs big reform and we need to move forward and we need big ideas um, to get better. Um, so if, uh, for those of you, just before we get started, but if you do want to grab a copy of Who Dares Losers, you can do so from Monash Publishing. And if you use the promo code, which will be put in the chat, it's INI offer 20 to get 20% off. Um, and we will be able to take some questions today. So uh, use the Q&A function in, in the Zoom webinar. Um, you'll, be, you'll be able to access it there um, and, uh, and we'll be able to see it and hopefully we'll get a chance to uh, get to some of them uh, at the end of today. Uh, and in the meantime, uh, we do have a moderated chat and if you have any feedback or comments, um, you know, we always love to hear them and so please, please add them there. But welcome, Peter. Thank you for joining us. Thanks very much for having me. It's good to be here and talk about Policy, not just politics, for a change. Yeah, that's right. And yet, and yet, so much of the premise of the book is that these are pariah policies. Um, you know, do you think that there's been a a shift in mood, or what, what was it that kind of drew you to write the the book um, at this time? Yeah, well, it, look, good question. We we were already in the midst of the pandemic, obviously, when we decided to write it, uh, and we saw it as as a moment in time, both with the potential coming out the other side of the pandemic for when we need big policy ideas and big reforms. You know, if you believe that there were already things that needed to be fixed in the policy structures of this country before the pandemic, you absolutely know that there's an even greater need for them to be repaired and altered in the aftermath of the pandemic. But of course, the problem is, and this is something that's been a problem for a long time, I think, not just right here and now, I think there is reform fatigue amongst a lot of people in the electorate. And I also think uh, that there is, as a probably part consequence of that, there is a real concern about the political risks attached uh, to major policy reform amongst the political class. And so Wayne and I, when doing this book, we basically thought to ourselves, well, there's never been a more important time than now for policy to, to be embraced, major policy reform. But there's also probably never been a time quite like this for a long time, at least, uh, where there's a timidity and a danger in trying to pursue major reform because the nature of our body politic, much less added to the reform fatigue of voters at the moment, is that you tear down ideas that are different and are slightly progressive, innovative. And our whole aim, and I know we'll talk about this, but our whole aim in the book wasn't to pick one side or the other. Uh, I know that you've read it, Michael. I mean, the, 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 the aim of the book was to pick different ideas uh, and they're ideas that I, I and Wayne would regard as worthy, uh, not necessarily that we even support wholeheartedly some of them, but they're worthy and they go across the spectrum from left to right as well as centrist, but they're just pariahs. They're never going to get embraced uh, given where the Australian political mood is at and we think that's a problem. So you know, part of the book is trying to explain why that's a problem and perhaps what are some ways out of it. Well, you mentioned policy fatigue, yet I, I, you know, certainly my opinion would be that we haven't Maybe maybe we've been talking about policy reform, but but we haven't really made any of it stick. Uh, you know, is that is that I guess are there big? Are, are, do you think people just need to slow it down, or do you think it, it is just the political debate is what's fatigued people about? Yeah, I think more the political debate now. So I think, I, and I agree with you about that. I think not only is now the time for major policy reform, but it's overdue as well because it has actually been a while since we've had it. So. I'm the, the fatigue is political caution, but it's also in the here and now, I would argue, uh, 
off the back of major reforms in the 1980s, the microeconomic reforms and all the rest of it from the Hawke-Keating era, followed by some significant reforms during the Howard era around, for example, the GST, gun reform maybe you can throw in as well, quite a substantial amount of IR reform before they went too far with work choices, probably shouldn't be forgotten either. And then when they did go too far and Kevin Rudd got elected, elected essentially on a platform of being conservative, but a progressive conservative, if you like, then it all kind of went to hell in a handbasket because Howard had missed opportunities in the second half of his prime ministership when he should have done more, not work choices, but a lot more around reform more generally, but he was just trying to win elections and hang on to government. Then Labor comes in and we all know the story of both sides of politics. What little they did try got either put, turned around politically uh, or they just didn't try in the case, I think, of the, the current government since they got in. And so at the end of it all, you, know, you then have a pandemic uh, which brings out things like the levels of inequality in the country and whatever else it might be, the problems with tax to spending and what you expect or don't expect from government. And these are all things that we then try to go through with some different policy ideas in the book. You know, if you, if you think that you want government to do X, Y, and Z, how do you fund it? How do you restructure to make what taxes you do pay more effective? Uh, what, uh, what social conscience do you have or not have? And therefore, what policies are supposed to follow? Unfortunately, um, with Bill Shorten losing the last election, whether you liked or disliked him, his government or his policy ideas, our argument is that he lost an election with some big target policies. And the worry is that that's only going to increase timidity out the other side of it, isn't it? Because it, you know how hard it is in opposition to make policy. It's going to be that much harder for opposition leaders to be courageous in policy development after what happened to Bill Shorten. So bad lessons being learned, I think, all around. Do you, you make, I think there's a chapter in the book that says, that says winners aren't reformers or, or something similar. I think I'm paraphrasing. And, but certainly, I guess, maybe they haven't been reformers from opposition in the past, but certainly we have had reformist governments in the past. Is there, do you think that there is a distinction between going to an election as a reformer and being a reformer in, in government, perhaps? Yeah, and I think that's where something's changed a lot, uh, which is the hard part to fix, you know, aside from the actual policy debates themselves, the nature of our political structure now, once upon a time, you could be like a, a Bob Hawke and a Paul Keating. You get into government, okay, and you haven't, they didn't campaign at the 83 election on the microeconomic reforms that they pursued. Uh, they didn't rule them out, but they certainly didn't campaign on them. Uh, they get into government and there was a tolerance that once you get your hands on the apparatus of government, you can get serious about policy. And you, can, you have the power of the public service and you have the capacity to force change and then you embrace it and off you go. They did that. Uh, they, you have some hairy elections along the way, but ultimately they then get judged over time on the successes of those policies. It's not dissimilar with John Howard. You know, he ruled some things out famously, um, but he also simply went small target, relatively so, and won the 96 election. Then he went big target to try to use that majority to win again in 98 campaigning for a GST, having done gun reform at a moment in time because of the Port Arthur massacre. And he'd also done a little bit of IR reform. Now, mm. he scrapes over the line in 98, he, and he therefore is able to continue his reform for the next three years when it came to tax. These days, the problem is now, in the sort of hyper-media environment that we're in, as well as hyper-oppositionist environment when it comes to the Team Red and Team Blue environment of the political parties, if you don't spell it all out at the election, you get held to account for therefore jumping the electorate after the election and you get criticised and, and hammered for that. That's a problem because spelling it out in opposition, firstly, we know is dangerous. Ask John Hewson, ask Bill Shorten, but it's also a hell of a lot harder because you don't have the apparatus of government. I mean, oppositions are relying on think tanks, uh, what they can cobble together with limited resources uh, as a political organisation without the power of the state behind them. The time to develop cogent, thoughtful policy is in government, not in opposition. Yet we expect oppositions to spell it all out yeah. and then only stick to that. And if they don't, then we hammer them for it. We, the media, we, the public. And I think that's one of the big contributors to the problem.
Well, maybe the next big policy reform is funding think tanks more. I'll appreciate it. So, uh, how, how, how did my book plug turn into a plug for your organisation? That's what um, I. But uh, well, no, you make a really good point about the ruling out before and after, and it almost is restricting in in policy reform. So, uh, the two things that come to mind instantly are uh, 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 Julia Gillard's um, "There will be no carbon tax," and then later um, "Dead buried and cremated, no cuts to ABC." under yep. Tony Abbott. And so almost some of the biggest, most iconic lines from them are things they wouldn't do rather than things they would do. And let's let's just build the cat on this on both of those. The first one, that we know carbon tax under the government I lead. Now, I'm as guilty as the next journalist because I at various points pointed out and characterised it as a carbon tax. It wasn't a carbon tax. It was pricing carbon with a transition from a fixed price to an emissions trading scheme. But those details get lost. The minute you say there will be no carbon tax under a government I lead, the perception, at the very least, is that you're basically basically going to do sweet FA when it comes to climate change. That's mm -hmm. the perception in a lot of mainstream voters' minds. But she did not break that promise, but she was locked in because of a so-called promise. As for Tony Abbott, fancy going on one of the lowest rating television programs the night before an election that you've got in the bag and then destroying your chance to govern thereafter by being so worried that you're so unpopular that the thing that you have to do at that moment in time is rule out doing anything. I mean, he didn't just rule out not, you know, no cuts in certain areas. He pretty much ruled out the full gambit of what constitutes about 80% of the budget. Uh, and then of course he comes in and tries to do exactly the opposite. Yeah. Now, you know, he, he, you know, he hung himself in that sense politically, uh, but it was the most unnecessary own goal uh, that you'll ever see in politics on the eve of an election. A, a million times more people saw those comments afterwards than ever saw them when he said it ahead of the election. Yeah, well, I mean, that doesn't that doesn't bode well, uh, I, I guess. <laughs> um, but I mean, maybe turning attention to the, some specific ideas, if I can, for a moment, because sure. uh, I thought your ideas were fascinating. You've somehow managed to pick something to piss off everyone uh, and also maybe appease everyone. But um, story of my life, I think, to be honest. That's, that's possibly right. <laughs> uh, but in doing so, that's almost a almost a, a case in highlight of of just why why this is so difficult um but i want i want to mention two that are that fit into almost uh two sides of a coin um and one is uh you you talk a lot about um uh um carbon pricing and and addressing mm -hmm. climate change but also about um privatizing or if i can use a more phrase and you might be able to say it more nuanced but the abc and you're you're talking about two things where there's almost an established tribe there's almost an established um you know you fit into one of those two camps um and so you know do you have hope for this or do you think that those camps are always going to be there and that's why they're pariah policies yeah look i i think they're going to always be pariah policies i mean we, we tried it's the same with you know we we talked about the universal basic income idea. We talked about death duties, which Bill Shorten never campaigned on, but he got attacked for possibly thinking about introducing because they were in a dream one night, maybe, who knows? Uh, and, and then, as you say, we talk about uh, a version of privatisation of the ABC, which is more a commercialisation of really um, being, allowing adverts on, uh, amongst a few other changes that that could then help fund, uh, as well as help create a level of separation, we hope, uh, from government to the ABC as well around funding structures. But it's not that we think necessarily that these are all uh, good ideas that should happen. We're not, we're not activists for these ideas. Some of them we feel more strongly about than others based partly on the research for the book, frankly. But what, what they are is they're ideas that Wayne and I have come across academically as well as in our popular reading and writing. And they're ideas that we've just decided are important enough to warrant serious discussion. Uh, and even if uh, after serious discussion and serious thoughtful debate and a green and a white paper process potentially even uh, through the public sector, even if at the end of all of that you decide that they're not the way to go, either because the circumstances aren't right or they need to be reconfigured, that's okay. Uh, we're not trying to pitch that this has to all happen. Our argument is that you can't decide policies like these uh, are rubbish with a couple of political lines attacking your opponent. Uh, and their ideas that for the most part, the universal basic income is probably the only one 
that has got limited evidence, even though it's probably the most substantive one in terms of having economists uh, from the left and the right starting to line up in favour of it. I think there's one isolated example where it was tested overseas that we talk about in the book. But most of these ideas, particularly something like death duties, but also commercialising public broadcasters, whatever you want to call it, they have been tried uh, both successfully and unsuccessfully all over the world. And for some reason, the country that we're in, that frankly used to be so innovative when it federated, the federation was innovative, frankly. Uh, the electoral system is incredibly innovative. Uh, we used to embrace that innovation. We got ahead of the curve with our microeconomic reforms when our economy was at that tipping point where we were going to go one way or the other. We, we've been known as a country that staves off a crisis before it manifests, uh, and we've been known to be innovative, but we've become so conservative in our thinking. And I don't mean polemic conservative. I mean unwilling to even have a goddamn debate about what's good and bad that can allow you at the end of the debate to decide whether you do think it's good or bad. Who, who makes a judgment before they've actually been prepared to put things up for scrutiny? That, that's what we're really trying to do here. I mean, this, this is bring an interesting question from Richard, who's, who's on, on the line um, uh, about... Um, whether maybe the quality of MPs and uh, over past compared to past generations is a is a factor. I mean, do you think that that's that's playing in, or is that almost too easy as a as a scapegoat? No, I think it's a factor. I don't think it's the only factor. And one one of the reasons is that I mean, MPs at one level are much more educated academically now than they ever were uh, on both sides of parliament, frankly, um, but they are less broad in their pre-parliamentary backgrounds. People like to attack the number of now, if you like, ex-insiders or, or continuing insiders who go from staffing or lobbying careers into politics. Now, there's, a, there's absolutely always been and always will be a place for people that have that background. I know you do, I do as well, uh, to a limited extent. But the thing is, it, it's, it's about the lack of diversity that goes with that. So we've now got more diversity, less in the Liberal Party, but more diversity in, th in terms of gender and ethnicity and these things, which is great. But we've got less diversity in their pre-parliamentary career backgrounds, which is not great. And I think that the problem of the Liberal Party is that the party of so-called small business has fewer people from a small business background. Those that do go in are often failed ex-small business types rather than the type you want to get in. Uh, those who on the CV claim to be from professional services spent the briefest of times as a lawyer or an accountant before getting into politics. Or in government uh, relations, maybe. As, exactly. If you know. in a, exactly. If they're in a business, they're not at the P&L end of the business. Uh, they are at the corporate affairs where they're already trading off their political contacts, possibly from staffing days before then going into parliament thereafter. That's the liberal problem and snippets of it are the Labor problem as well. I think the bigger problem in the Labor Party is that with the shrinking of the trade union movement, uh, to be from the trade union movement now is less representative of the broader working class. Whereas once upon a time, if you were from the trade union movement, when it was much more broadly representative of the working class population, that was a great thing. Uh, because you and, and also I think union officials used to come off the factory floor a lot more so they were more in touch by definition than they are today where a lot of union officials now come from a slightly different trajectory not all and so that you know both parties have got problems I guess is that is my point when it comes to the backgrounds but that's not the only problem uh, the media has to take the blame the public has to take the blame as well this is a triumvirate of failure between the politicians the voters uh, and the media as well I think that uh, you, you're not painting a very positive rosy picture there um, but we're all but in this is, together let me tell there you is a on. but on a um this the, one of the policies you mentioned in the book that that i guess we're heavily invested in at mckell having done a lot of work in it is the transition from stamp duty to land tax which isn't something i think you specifically say but you talk about uh taxing housing more mm. effectively and and so on and you know mckell's looked at this in fact the same paper that recommended the negative gearing reform that we pushed heavily and was part of the public debate recommended a transition from stamp duty to land tax. Now that's actually being pursued by the New South Wales Liberal mm. Treasury. Um, and we've put out uh, papers supporting that and trying to push a bit of a, uh, I guess, slightly more, um, a, a, a bit more bipartisan approach to these, these things. Do you see um, something different happening there? Why is it happening in New South Wales and not or why is it happening in this one instance, maybe not elsewhere? Because 
you know, the politicians are coming from the same pool. There's still social media. They're still working in the same environment. Why is it working here and not elsewhere? That's a good question. I mean, that, that one, the whole issue of making adjustments to land taxes and therefore creating uh, a more productive outcome for, you know, people with home ownership, their mobility, their ability to, to therefore follow where the jobs are and not be tied down by some of those you know, more cumbersome tax structures. Uh, it's, a, it's an unusual one. It's almost the exception that proves the rule, isn't it, that we do have a policy problem, uh, but there's an exception uh, on the way through. Why is it different? I don't know. I mean, there's partly circumstances, partly just the opportunity of the moment and having uh, organisations like yours, as well as having the capacity, perhaps, in that example to, to lead the way, which is partly what the Federation was designed to do, competitive federalism I'm talking about. So hopefully, that sparks something elsewhere as well. Uh, my fear, though, uh, is that it's one of those ones that we can give a tick to. Let's see that we get there, by the way, yes. before we give it too, too big a tick. Yes. Um, but even if we do get there, uh, it's one of those ones that, uh, you know, my fear is that, you know, the, the political skin lost on the way through potentially uh, will ward off others going there. Uh, and even if it does achieve change, it doesn't create the broader message, does it? that you know, there are valuable ways of doing things differently that can create better economic structures and better social outcomes to go with it. You, men you mentioned at the beginning, and, and I think it's also a line you use in the, the book as well, about never, um, you mentioned the COVID pandemic and you obviously that was during the writing of the book. Um, we're obviously looking at it now and it's shaping our policy debate, but you, you wrote never waste a crisis is I think the, the term. So, yep. you know, are we wasting this crisis? I think so. Uh, I mean, we've we've spent a lot during it, which I'm not a critic of. Uh, I mean, you know, it can always be better spent, but I'm also not too much of a critic of that just because it was more about speed than than prioritising, um, you know, the, the sort of the, the checks and the balances of the spend. I do note the hypocrisy uh, of the same side of politics being okay about that now having been critical of, of, of similar during the global financial crisis, having said that, uh, but I'm not too critical of that. But I do think uh, that there is a capacity absolutely up in now uh, that we have much larger debt and realities around where that debt sits in, thankfully for now, a low interest rate environment. There's a capacity to redefine how we think about debt uh, and therefore see further debt as productive debt, the same way that individuals and businesses do uh, in the way that they structure their affairs. So what, what Wayne and I, and we talk a bit about this in the book, what we define as the good, if you like, in the opportunity that presents out the other side of the, the, the mega spending that we've seen during the pandemic is that just maybe it helps us move, move past uh, that mind-numbingly stupid debate that we've had for so long in this country, which is just that, you know, surplus equals good, deficit equals bad. Uh, it, you know, it is not one that you'll hear a credible economist the world over say is as simple as it works when it comes to government balance sheets. So there is an opportunity there to get past that. But even since we wrote the book, I have to say, uh, I've seen examples of uh, the current government falling that little bit back uh, to try to, you know, albeit with a great deal of chutzpah, argue that, uh, that you know, don't trust Labor because they'll let spending get out of control. Uh, so, you know, the cultural shift isn't quite there yet even though the fundamentals would suggest the capacity for a shift around that type of debate. I'd, I'd, I'd venture a guess that the, uh, the, the truce on that debate is only so long as the, the current government is in power, but um, let's see, let's see how we go. Yeah. Um, it's interesting that uh, three comments have come through that all represent three uh, branches of the same kind of question. And they are, looking at why, I guess, I'm imagining that a lot of the, the, the people putting forward these comments have the same issue I have where we, we want to be so much better than we are. And so what is holding us back? And so I'm, I've got some examples. Social media, how that plays. Journalists and their gotcha moments. As, an, as, a, as a, a journalist, I'd love to see your reaction on some of that as well. And also whether uh, organised vested interests are almost too mm. settled in the in the status quo and make it too hard for leaders to overcome them. So on, on those three as kind of three explanations, do you have a, a view on on where they rank or how they how they um, are playing a role in stifling 
debate or policy reform. Yeah, now remind me of the first one. The social media. Okay. Yeah. So, so, yeah. yeah, so social media, journalists, uh, and the third one now, I've got, I've got a memory uh, like thing. a goldfish at the moment. Okay, yeah. so yeah, so start, starting with social media. Yeah. Uh, absolutely. I think, I think social media exacerbates the problem that the journalist gotcha moment uh, is also alluding to, frankly, because it, it is it is micro uh, individual by individual gotcha moments almost on social media with the way that people interact, and it's in the moment as well. So it's initial thoughtless reactions that we all do it on social media, uh, which which are rewarded in that environment rather than uh, panned. It's the exact opposite of what we all got taught as children uh, and continue to be life lessons. You know, sleep on it, think about it, give it some serious reflection. Don't be glib. Don't, uh, you know, sort of base a reaction on something as short as X number of characters and so forth. So I think social media is a big problem. It goes hand in glove uh, with modern journalism. I think once upon a time, journalism was seen as much more of a profession around uh, political journalism, for example. And there was, uh, when there was, you know, big mastheads only, that, that had its own problems, you know, there's sort of the gatekeeper nature of it. But it did result, I think, in more reflective journalism. These days, journalism doesn't have the capacity to be as reflective as it once was. The gotcha moment is more prominent. It's cheaper journalism, so is commentary journalism. Uh, and, you know, it, journalists are trying to constantly file, constantly profile build if they're sort of, you know, sort of opinionistas in style. Less time to reflect and to read and to uh, do legwork that doesn't necessarily result in immediate outcomes. So I think that journalism has got huge problems. And I do think, I think vested interests have always been a problem to an extent, but that's, uh, I, I think that's like a manifest of the other problems. So for example, you know, when you had different pre-parliamentary backgrounds of members of parliaments that were broader uh, in, in a sort of work environment, diverse, diversity of background sense. Uh, and when you had uh, a parliamentary pensions, even frankly, that was able to, you know, insulate the political class to some extent from uh, you know, the, the, the outside needs economically that vested interests can impose. Uh, those things change when gotcha journalism joins in, when the media structure is under threat uh, and therefore the business model's challenged. And as a result of that, you know, you, you have journalists, uh, you know, fewer journalists, essentially. It becomes easier for vested interests to fill that void with PR and spin. And, and then when you have uh, expectations on oppositions that they are able to that they have to do more in policy development than they once had to because of what we talked about earlier, then suddenly vested interests play a role for those oppositions to help with policy or they play a role for governments to tear down those oppositions. And either way is a problem because if you get into power with their help, then you owe them. Uh, and if you're already in power and they help you tear down oppositions, well, then you owe them as well. So, uh, you know, they've always been there, but their capacity to influence, I think, has grown somewhat. Now, I'm conscious the, of, of the time because we've just flown through things, but there are, were just a couple more questions. Do you mind if we, uh, yeah, sure. we jump onto these? Because uh, there's a very interesting one about the role of uh, 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 focus grouping and polling in the policymaking process. Um, and particularly, I'm, I'm interested in polling has become almost an advocacy tool. Uh, because you can get so many different results depending on how you poll. Um, so how how do you think they've impacted the the debate? Has it been a positive thing as part of a discussion with the broader electorate, or is it narrowed us to a shorter term, you know, wagging hmm. the tail, wagging the dog environment? I think it started. I think it started as a positive because it became a way that politicians could do more than had more than gut feel to be able to get a sense of what the voters and the public wanted. So. That research, if you like, originally, I think, was good because originally it helped move us away from the, the concept of the elected dictatorship, where you get your say every three years, but you don't get much else. Uh, so therefore, the, the research initially was a way for politicians to get a sense of what the community thought and be a little bit more reflective. Now, you, know, you want your leaders to, to be prepared to lead, but being reflective is also important. So it, it did do that, but not anymore. I think now there are two problems with it. One, you identified... Uh, is that you can adjust questions around polling and have profound impacts on the nature of outcomes, and that can then have a distorting impact in and of itself. But the other factor, I think, that goes with that 
is that you these days it is the tail wagging the dog for the political class. Uh, you know, a, a lot of politicians now will have their policy scripts and ideas dictated by what the polls show. And that takes conviction out of politics. It, it makes for nervous politicians, even when they want to show conviction, if there is a party official uh, who might have the capacity to also organise against them, presenting polling that shows how unpopular this is, how many seats it might cost. You know, I can't imagine John Howard, when he was prepared to crash or crash through on the GST, for example, being prepared to do that 10 years later. That's how much I think, much less 20, that's how much I think polling and focus groups had an impact then over that time frame, And it already existed then. He knew from that research that it was unpopular, but he decided he was going to go for it. Okay. Now, I, I, I don't know that he would with the amount and the proliferation of it these days. Uh, and I don't know that you'd even get politicians like him or others on the Labor side who have such strong convictions that have long been unpopular by that point in their political career anyway, um, because they've already learned to jettison that sort of thing to get ahead. Well, um, I've never hoped you're wrong so much in my life. <laughs> uh, but um, I, I'm, I'm going to apologise in advance to all the people here because we have so many questions that they want to ask and we'll get through. But I might end on this one, which is a little bit of fishing for some positive news, but don't, don't, don't uh, feel pressure to it. It is perhaps this is a problem globally. Like the, some of these same discussions are certainly happening Elsewhere, we hear about policy paralysis in Washington. We hear about reactionism in the UK. Um, are we better or worse than them? Oh, no, we're better. Look, I'll be glass half full on two fronts for you. One, I think, compar I mean, I could spin this as negative as you like. Comparatively, we are the lesser of evils compared to a lot of other countries, Western democracies the world over, who I think are more in a mirth when it comes to all of these issues that we've been talking about. So we're not as bad as them. Uh, I guess the slight concern is that we're going down the same road as them unless something changes. So we might not be as bad, but we're on the same road to nowhere. That's the risk. But the other half of where I can be glass half full about this, to fix it, you know, the sort of how do you fix it? There are, syst there are system problems that can be fixed. They're hard. Uh, and, you know, we go through some of them in the book. But Away from that, there is also one simple way to fix it, which is the intangible way to fix it. At some point, however long it takes, you will have on one side of politics or the other, ideally both at the same time to make it better, you will have a leader come along who does decide to crash or crash through and has what it takes to succeed rather than tries and fails. And that moment becomes a key moment because then they make big changes, inevitably they end up on the right side of history having done so uh, if it's been a thoughtful process. They get that little break, that lucky break on the way through where they do win an election or two as a consequence. We see the manifest goodness that comes from the willingness to do that. And then other people get inspired into politics. Voters are reminded about what really matters in politics. So that's a, a long-winded way of saying it only takes one person to fulfil that role for the whole quagmire to be repaired at least significantly temporarily and I think that's the important thing and then it becomes a debate about who is that person when do they come along and you know when they do we'll all be thinking thank god let's just hope uh, that it's not only in our lifetimes but it's uh, in our relatively young lifetimes uh, a few times over oh well that's fantastic and uh, what I would say is that uh, you'll go from being uh, strongly agreeing to strongly opposing within a chapter <laughs> Um, but if you're, you're keen to have a read, uh, you can get um, Peter Van Onselen's book, uh, Who Dares Loses Pariah Policies from Monash University Publishing. Uh, the email it will be in uh, your latest email from Mikel as well as a 20% uh, a discount code. Uh, so please go off and um, get a copy. It's part of a great series in the national interest that Monash uh, University Publishing are uh, are doing um, and uh, always important to be telling public policy stories, especially thought, well thought through in book form. Um, so I really thank you for uh, doing that, Peter, and for joining us today. Thanks, Michael. And a quick shout out, if I can, to my colleague, Wayne Errington, as the co-author. Him and I write our books together all the time. He's a full-time academic, uh, one of the brightest guys I know, uh, and an absolutely important, not only contributed to the book and every book we've done, um, but, but crucial to always reminding me um, from that scholarly perspective 
to really give those in-depth policy ideas a focus. Uh, and you know his contribution uh, is is invaluable. Uh, so you know he's he's uh, more than a co-equal partner in this. Fantastic. And uh, yes, I, I apologise, Wayne, uh, but thank you for making sure it, it happened. And uh, also, I, I guess regard, maybe we can disagree on certain policies, but uh, let's hope that um, we do get out of the malaise at the moment and get to a more positive um, view. I think big ideas are needed if we're going to address things like inequality or climate change and others. Um, so yep. thank you so much, Peter. Thank you everyone at home for joining us. I'm sorry I couldn't get to all your questions, um, but we, uh, we will always have more opportunities and thanks again. Thank you.